on the second floor, where the faint light barely illuminated the walls, a nightmare scene unfolded. The woman's body lay as if she had been deliberately hidden from view. Blood, thick and dark, soaked the carpet like a living shadow, leaving behind gruesome signs of struggle. She tried to run away, but every step she took was met with blows. Bloody prints on the stairs testified to her bleeding as she tried to escape. This house was the beginning of the end for her, and whoever had come into it with the knife was also familiar to her. He knew how to disable the alarm system, how to make sure no one heard her scream. But what could have driven him to such cruelty? In this quiet place, among familiar walls, a nightmare had played out, the origin of which no one could have predicted. It wasn't just a murder. It was a massacre that left behind more questions than answers. David, along with his two daughters, were forced to flee to North Carolina as they became the subject of intense media scrutiny. According to David, he was severely hurt by the rumors that were spread after the events. The media portrayed him in a negative light, making up one untruth after another, which almost completely ruined his reputation as a respected doctor and a good father. Daniel's release came as a new shock to their family. They feared that the real culprit might want revenge. However, according to Daniel's own assurance, he was able to enjoy freedom and overcome his addiction for the first time in four years, so he had no intentions of revenge. However, the feeling of freedom did not last long. The Alabama Court of Appeals reviewed the decision to release him. All trials were suspended, and just a week later Daniel was back behind bars. Now he was to remain in prison until the appeals court made its decision. He faced two options, a new trial or double jeopardy. In the latter case, a retrial could be seen as an attempt to convict him twice for the same crime, which would result in his eventual release. During this period, Daniel's lawyer continued to fight for his release. The prosecutor's office persisted in its version of events, believing him guilty of taking the woman's life. The lawyer tried to gain access to the computer and phone number of Karen's husband, suspecting his involvement in the crime, but was repeatedly rebuffed. He finally managed to discover that someone with access to the Tipton home had deleted files from the computer after Karen's death, but before they were handed over to the police and the data could not be recovered. This seemed highly suspicious. In addition, the lawyer again drew attention to the testimony of road workers who had seen the deceased's husband arrive that day an hour earlier than he had reported the incident to the police. No one else was seen outside the house, which seemed like direct evidence against the widower. The lawyer's fight for justice lasted a decade. In the end, after a brief pause of just one week, Daniel spent all those years behind bars. In his third trial, held on May 14, 2009, a jury found him not guilty. This came as a real shock to the prosecutor's office, and the prosecutor publicly stated that Daniel Moore was the perpetrator and the jury had made a serious error. After the acquittal, Daniel left Alabama and began seeking legal counsel to file a civil lawsuit against the city of Dockett and its police department. He claimed that his constitutional rights had been violated and that he had spent 10 years in prison for nothing. However, his lawsuit was dismissed. The murder of a beautiful and respected woman the wife of a doctor, could not go unnoticed in this quiet and peaceful town. The community was outraged and put pressure on the police to act quickly to make the streets safe. Rumors of a brutal massacre began to spread among the locals. Some suspected a husband, others a lover, and still others thought it might have been the wife of one of her many admirers. The situation changed dramatically a month after the tragedy. Police were in pursuit of a thief trying to flee in a car. After the crash, they apprehended 24-year-old Daniel Wade Moore. Just 48 hours later, law enforcement was certain he was the one who killed Karen. Two days after his arrest, when Daniel was released on bail, he confessed to his uncle, Sparky Moore, that he had been at the couple's home on Chapel Hill Road. According to him, he and two accomplices entered the house assuming no one would be there. However, inside they unexpectedly encountered Karen. Daniel stated that the situation took him by surprise and he killed the woman in a panic. This confession shocked Daniel's family. Sparky, without thinking long, informed the police of his nephew's involvement in the crime. Daniel was soon tracked down and apprehended at the motel where he was staying for a few days. 
accessories for the manufacture and use of illegal substances were also found there. The young man was arrested again and taken to the police station for questioning. A few hours later, when detectives took a five-minute break, Daniel took advantage of the moment and stabbed himself 16 times with a penknife. When police officers returned he was bleeding from multiple shallow wounds. The pain and blood loss had weakened him so much that he had to be sent to the hospital instead of further questioning. Based on the behavior of the prime suspect, the detectives were confident that they had apprehended the right man. Daniel had an obvious problem with illegal substances, and valuables were missing from the victim's home. He had no alibi for the day Karen was killed. Plus, his suicide attempt during the first interrogation seemed like direct evidence of his guilt. However, it required further confirmation. Security was on duty outside the wounded suspect's room while detectives continued to investigate. The apartment of a young man in his 20s was searched, and an important piece of evidence was found. A toolbox of tools from a company that installed alarm systems was discovered. It was this company that installed the alarm system in the Tipton house, and Daniel worked there. Investigators interviewed the widower, and David, looking at the photograph, confirmed that it was Daniel who had come to their home several months before the tragedy to install the system. According to detectives, the faulty alarm system was the key to all doors for the criminals. The perpetrator could have simply knocked on the door and introduced himself as a repairman coming to fix the malfunction. Karen could have recognized him and so quietly led him into the house, but he attacked her and took her life. Since the suspect's confession had not yet been obtained, the police had to reconstruct a picture of the events on the basis of the results of forensic examination and evidence found in the house. However, there was no direct evidence. No footprints, fingerprints, or DNA could be found. Even the alleged intimate molestation left no traces or fluids to analyze. The attack apparently began on the first floor, near the front door where a drop of blood was found. As experts believed, the first blow was struck in the victim's neck area. After that, the woman was forced up to the second floor, leaving drops of blood behind her. Her torn clothes were found in the bedroom, and the bed was drenched in blood. At one point, Karen managed to break free from her attacker's grasp, and she even made it to the stairs. Here, however, she was caught up and killed with a knife. The confession that Daniel made to his uncle linked him 100% to the crime. According to law enforcement, he completely matched the criminal profile compiled by FBI specialists. People who knew him described him as a violent man with a history of addiction to illegal substances. He was probably under the influence and out of control at the time of the crime. Even if he wasn't, his psyche was so unstable that he could have attacked Karen for no apparent reason. When the suspect regained consciousness in the hospital and was able to talk to investigators, he adamantly refused to admit his guilt. Daniel claimed that he was not in the house on the day of the crime, and that he had no idea who might be involved in the crime. Despite this, he did not retract his confession to his uncle but assured the police that it was false. According to him, he was under a lot of pressure at the time because of legal problems, and his grandfather and uncle added to that pressure. He confessed to a crime he did not commit on purpose to scare off his uncle and get his relatives to stop interfering in his life. The young man's words sounded like incoherent ramblings, to which no one paid any attention. Suddenly, however, his uncle, Sparky Moore, changed his position and sided with Daniel. After considering all the circumstances, his uncle concluded that the story of the murder could have been made up by his nephew to divert his eyes. Sparky claimed that Daniel's only real problem was his addiction to illegal substances. He wanted it to finally be over, to go back to his old life, as he could no longer fight the hardships of his addiction. His grandfather and uncle actively tried to set him on the right path, but Neil decided to scare them off by inventing a fictitious crime. Even some detectives began to doubt that this young man, with obvious problems, could have been involved in taking Karen's life. As a result of years of court battles and constant public pressure, the case of Karen Tipton's murder and the fate of Daniel Moore has become a true epic. But to truly understand how this tangled and tragic plot came to be, let's go back to the beginning. Who was Daniel Moore, and how did he end up at the center of such a high-profile case? And who was Karen Tipton? whose life was brutally cut short. Understanding the true circumstances of their story requires diving into that fateful night when tragedy struck and analyzing all the details that led to such unexpected and dramatic consequences.
Let's go back to the beginning and figure out how it all started. Who was involved in these events, and what really happened. Let's start our journey back to the night Karen was murdered, and trace all the key moments that formed the basis of this complex and tragic story. When David Tipton was a medical student doing his residency at a hospital in Alabama in 1984, he met nurse Karen Kraft. Their relationship began as a friendship, but over time developed into romantic feelings. Five years after meeting Karen admitted to her brother and sister that David, the ideal candidate for the role of husband and father of their future children. She saw him as a calm, reliable, and pleasant man with whom she was ready to spend the rest of her life. June 24, 1989. They celebrated a lavish wedding and then moved to the quiet town of Decatur, Alabama, where they both got a job at the local hospital. Here, in their new home, the couple had two daughters, and their family's life went on in a measured and happy manner. They maintained good relations with their neighbors, attended church regularly, and looked like a model family from the outside. Everything was fine until one day their quiet life changed forever. On March 12, 1999, David, 39, recalled the day as unremarkable. Everyone was minding their own business, looking forward to the evening family dinner and watching television. Karen, having left her job after the birth of her children, became a homemaker and did the daily chores while David was on shift at the hospital. That afternoon, he returned home a little earlier than usual as he and his wife planned to go to the theater. Almost immediately, however, he was overcome with anxiety. Approaching the house from the garage, David noticed that the front door was unlocked, which was highly unusual for them, as they always made sure the doors were locked. Deciding that Karen might have simply forgotten to lock the door or left it open for the delivery man, he went inside. However, his unease increased when he saw the removed panel from the security alarm on the kitchen counter. Although it looked odd, David didn't immediately give it serious consideration since the alarm hadn't worked in a while and they were waiting for it to be fixed. However, the idea that Karen would have decided to remove the panel before the handyman arrived seemed completely illogical to him. On his way to work in the morning, David noticed that the alarm panel was in its usual place and there were no scheduled visits from the security company for the day. When he returned home, he headed to the hallway to hang up his coat and suddenly noticed a small drop of blood on the floor tiles. He didn't think much of it at first, thinking it might have been an accidental scratch or a nosebleed from a family member. He called out to Karen, but there was silence in response. The children didn't respond either, although the house was usually always noisy at this time. Assuming they might have been on the second floor and hadn't heard him, David headed for the stairs. But a few more drops of blood appeared on the floor, making him wary. When he reached the stairs, he was overcome with anxiety. Next to the door in the hall, he saw a smeared blood stain, as if someone had tried to wipe it off. The stain was quite large, and David immediately realized that someone might have been seriously hurt. He called out for his loved ones again, but the silence grew more and more ominous. As he went up to the second floor, David realized the reason for this oppressive silence. His wife lay before him, naked and mutilated with multiple stab wounds, her throat slit. He could barely contain himself from shock, but he immediately dialed the emergency services, saying that he had found his wife dead and could not find his children. Several police cars and an ambulance immediately arrived at the scene. The law enforcement officers urgently started looking for the children, and fortunately, it turned out that they were still at school. No one had taken them away. When the police arrived on the scene, they saw a horrifying scene. The victim had 28 stab wounds on his body, several of which were fatal. Forensic investigators began their examination and determined that the death occurred sometime between 1 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. At 1 p.m., Karen was on the phone with a friend. A witness reported that the conversation was normal and calm, with no signs of agitation in Karen's voice. Karen was scheduled to go to school at 2.30 a.m. to pick up her children but by that time, she was dead. Naturally, investigators immediately turned their attention to David, who had found his wife's body. They hoped that he would be able to provide information about a possible perpetrator. However, David could not name a single person who could have massacred a 39-year-old housewife and mother of two children. Since Karen was found naked, investigators speculated that the crime may have had an intimate motive. David also reported that a purse containing money and several pieces of jewelry were missing, 
but a diamond ring remained on the victim's finger. In addition, although the garage door was open, no signs of forced entry were found in the home. Investigators were shocked by the brutality of the attack. It didn't look like a robbery gone wrong or a random self-defense. The perpetrator had clearly come with the intent to commit a violent crime. At the time of Karen's death, the eldest daughter, Carolyn, was only seven years old and the youngest, Catherine, only three years old. Naturally, David became the first suspect. He realized that suspicion would fall on him when he called the emergency services, but had no other choice. He hoped for a fair investigation as he was at work at the time of the attack and was confident that all suspicions would be cleared from him after the first interview. David claimed that not only was he not in town at the time of the crime, but he was also not working at the hospital. After detectives spoke with David, they proceeded to verify his alibi. The hospital manager confirmed that David left the hospital at 3.30 a.m. and did not return home until 4.15 a.m. The 911 call came in at 4.27 p.m., which coincided with the time of his gruesome discovery in the house. No scratches were found on David's body indicating attempts at self-defense, and his clothes were clean of blood. These facts made it possible to rule him out as a suspect. For David, it was a significant relief. But for the detectives, the situation was exacerbated. Taking David off the suspect list left them with no new leads. Law enforcement had no other suspects, and no one close to Karen could imagine who would be so violent as to stab her 28 times. Looking for a solution to the problem, police enlisted the help of the FBI to create a psychological profile of the potential perpetrator. However, despite the efforts of both services, no significant progress was made. Extensive data was compiled and analyzed, formalized in a report of more than 200 pages, which became the basis for further investigations. The whole case was based on circumstantial evidence. No direct evidence against him was ever collected. Several workers who were paving in front of Karen's house on the day of the crime did not see Neil enter the house. No fingerprints were found in the Tipton's garage or in the rooms drenched in blood to link him to the crime. Searches of his apartment, motel room and automobile also yielded no physical evidence of his presence at the crime scene. Virtually everyone around Daniel was now convinced that he was incapable of such a brutal crime. His older sister and mother insisted that despite his legal and addiction problems, he was a man of conscience and would never raise his hand against a defenseless woman. His addiction to illegal substances began to haunt him from his teenage years, and he was repeatedly prosecuted for this reason. Up until that point, however, Daniel had never been in trouble with the law for violence. He had never even been in a fight. Daniel attributed his suicide attempt to a nervous breakdown. He claimed that he had never thought about killing someone else in his life. The only person he could have pointed a gun at was himself. Under questioning, he lost control of himself, fearing that he might be accused of someone else's crime. He did not really want to die, but was gripped by despair and could not cope with the pressure of the situation. According to him, the police officers put him under a lot of moral pressure during the interrogation, humiliating him in front of his own family. The officers told him he would remain a hardened criminal and addicted to illegal substances, something he eventually began to believe himself. When the cops got out, he found no other way to turn his life around other than to try to kill himself. In retrospect, Daniel admitted that it was the biggest mistake of his life. However, the police had no other suspects and were convinced that he was involved in the crime. In October 2001, Daniel Moore was charged with murder, a capital offense in the state of Alabama. He was represented by an experienced attorney with 30 years of experience who believed in his client's innocence. The attorney believed that the investigation had made a mistake and that the crime was a crime of passion committed by someone close to the victim. In his eyes, David Tipton was a suitable suspect but the list of possible perpetrators could have been much broader. On November 4, 2002, Daniel went to trial. The prosecutor's office insisted that they had enough evidence to consider Moore the perpetrator, claiming that the crime was the result of a robbery that had gone awry. However, not everyone who followed the trial was convinced of his guilt. People who knew the accused argued that he was incapable of such a brutal crime. Besides, if money was his goal, he could have chosen a less conspicuous target. A house in the center of the city that was attacked in broad daylight, especially since a traffic office was operating across the street, seemed a highly unsuitable target for a robbery. 
these facts raised serious concerns among many who followed the case. Perhaps the real culprit was still at large and could continue to commit crimes. The brutality of the crime was too great, even for a man under the influence of illegal substances. The robbery version seemed unlikely, since the perpetrator had no real reason to kill the woman, even if she caught him in the act. An independent expert engaged by the defense argued that the crime was personal. He suggested that such crimes often start with a conversation, escalating into an argument, then a fight, and eventually ending in a stabbing. There were two ways the perpetrator could have gotten into the house. Either Karen let him in herself, or he had a key. Either way, it was someone she knew. The expert also scrutinized the method of dismantling the alarm system and concluded that the method clearly pointed to someone other than the defendant. According to him, a professional alarm system installer would have known how to completely disable the system without removing the keypad or leaving traces. In addition, the expert examined blood traces in the house and concluded that the victim did not initially try to escape, but moved slowly or even stood still. It was only on the second floor, in the bedroom, that she was attacked again. While attempting to escape, Karen received several blows to her back that proved fatal. According to the expert, the key events unfolded on the second floor of the house, in the hallway where Karen was fatally wounded. After her death, the body was moved so that it could not be seen from the first floor. This indicated that the perpetrator was familiar with the layout of the house, perhaps having visited or even lived there frequently. The traces of blood on the second floor had been erased, indicating an attempt to conceal the crime. The expert noted that such behavior is uncharacteristic of a burglar, who usually hurries to leave the scene of a crime to avoid apprehension. The defense argued that Daniel Moore was not necessarily the only possible perpetrator. The prime suspect, they argued, could have been Karen's husband, David Tipton, who was immediately ruled out as a suspect. In court, highway workers who were working nearby on the day of the crime confirmed that they had seen David's pickup truck outside the house at least an hour before the police arrived. The defense put forward the theory that David may have had a motive for the crime, jealousy. It was revealed that in the months before Karen's death, she had been having an affair on the side, which could have caused the tragedy. A neighbor claimed to have repeatedly seen a light-colored pickup truck parked outside the house, indicating frequent visits. In addition, David himself admitted at trial that a few weeks before the tragedy, his best friend Mike had sent Karen an email suggesting a temporary partner swap. This badly hurt David, who was resentful of both Mike and his wife allegedly meeting in secret. Karen, for her part, may not have been happy with her husband. On the day of his death, she used his computer and found that the hard drive was almost completely filled with specific adult movies, which may have shocked and angered her. Arguably, upon returning home, David may have had a conflict with his wife that escalated into tragedy. However, David vehemently denied involvement, insisting that despite the problems in the relationship, he loved Karen and would never hurt her. He believed that the lawyer's attempts to place the blame on him were manipulation and lies. Besides, his alibi was indisputable. The prosecutor's office, for their part, argued that they had enough circumstantial evidence to convict Daniel. The main focus was on two hairs found in the bedroom that looked like Daniel's hair. While standard DNA tests did not yield an accurate result, a simplified testing technique was used, less accurate, but able to exclude 99.8% of the population, leaving a few hundred or even thousands of potential owners. The prosecutor's office claimed that Daniel Moore was the only one of this circle of suspects who had the means, motive, and opportunity to commit the murder. In February 2003, Daniel Moore began serving his sentence on death row at the Alabama Correctional Institution after being found guilty of premeditated murder on January 23rd and sentenced to death by injection. However, his fight for life was just beginning. An attorney immediately took on the job, and shortly after the sentencing, a new witness came forward. It turned out that Pam, a neighbor of the Tipton family, claimed to have seen Karen at the mailbox of the house around 3.30 p.m. She claimed that she called the police immediately afterward upon learning of Karen's death, but her message apparently got lost and was not recorded. Law enforcement officials confirmed that there was no record of the call. The prosecution believed the neighbor's testimony was not included in the case because of a possible timing error. The forensic examiner stated that at 3.30 a.m., Karen was already dead. 
If she had been alive, she could have left to pick up the children, making the neighbor's testimony questionable. The lawyer, on the other hand, was certain that the neighbor's testimony could not have disappeared by accident, since it clearly did not match the investigator's version of the story. This led him to believe that the prosecution had withheld some of the evidence from the beginning. A motion for a new trial was soon filed, which fundamentally changed Daniel's fate. The defense attorney discovered a 245-page FBI crime report on Karen Tipton. The prosecutor's office had previously denied the existence of this report, which turned out to be false. The document mentioned Karen's double life, including numerous extramarital affairs, which may have provided motivation for David and her lovers. This new information indicated that there were other possible suspects who were free to enter the house and commit the murder. David Tipton protested these claims, calling them hearsay rather than actual evidence. Some jurors began to question the fairness of the guilty verdict, a view shared by the sentencing judge. The judge accused the prosecutor and his assistant of deliberately withholding evidence, leading to the conviction of an innocent man. As a result of this unjust ruling, the judge signed the document that freed Daniel from death row in 2005. After years of struggle and litigation, Daniel Moore was once again in the spotlight of the law in 2011. This time, he was charged with burglary. A guilty plea resulted in eight years in prison. When Moore was released from prison, questions about his true culpability in the murder of Karen Tipton remained unanswered. The crime that had rocked the small town was still considered unsolved. Meanwhile, in the shadows of this tangled story, the life of the victim's family continued. Immersed in his new existence, the man who used to be Karen's husband and now plays the role of loving father to their daughters remained a mystery. There is a disturbing hunch. Perhaps this man, hiding behind the mask of a caring parent, was actually involved in a horrific crime. Uncertainty and suspicion in this case continue to stir minds, and who knows, maybe the truth is yet to be revealed.